Neck to neck in the developed worlds today, the two killers are cancer and heart disease. What I'd like to look at in this presentation is the heart. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep the heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. So there's two things there. Keep the heart with all diligence. I want to show you how to keep the heart with all diligence. And out of the it are the issues of life. The issue of life is the blood. And so you can, you can get your blood beautifully and fluid so that it's a lot easier for the heart to pump it. The heart is a muscle and it's made up of a whole lot of little muscle cells. And what I'd like to look at is I'd like to look at that muscle cell. So here is the muscle cell and I'm going to show you what happens when the when the glucose goes in. Glucose is the main fuel in the body. It goes into the cell and it goes through a 20-step pathway. And this 20-step pathway gives us two units of energy. The end result of the 20-step pathway is a chemical form of glucose called pyruvate. Pyruvate is the chemical form of glucose that gets fed into what's often called the powerhouse. And that powerhouse is only an eight-step pathway, but that eight-step pathway delivers to us a whopping 36 units of energy. Whoa! What makes the difference? How come a 20-step pathway only gives us two units of energy and an eight-step pathway gives us 36? The difference is oxygen. Oxygen is the most vital element needed for life. This pathway is a no-oxygen pathway, so basically that pathway is called the anaerobic pathway and this pathway is called the aerobic pathway because it uses oxygen. Now understanding that, you can see to get more out of our heart, we need more oxygen. And the most powerful way to oxygenate the body is exercise. But there is a form of exercise that will get the heart up onto a more effective and efficient rate of running and that is what's often called HIT high intensity interval training. So here, here is the, the initials, high intensity interval training. You've probably heard of it, it's probably the most popular way of, of uh, training today. But what I want to show you is the effect that it is having on the heart. So as the name implies, there are intervals of high intensity and that's often done for probably most researchers come in at about a 30 seconds and then a recovery time and the recovery is often 90 seconds and it's often done for a, in, for a cycle of six. So this will be 30 seconds high intensity, 90 seconds recovery back to this. So you're doing that six times. Now the reason why that has such a powerful effect on the heart is because the effect it's having on each muscle cell that makes up the heart. So when you go through the interval training, the 20 step pathway speeds up, the 8 step pathway speeds up. Now this 20 step pathway is very fast and this 8 step pathway is very slow. So when you speed up, more pyruvate's being made in the 20-step pathway than can be fed into the powerhouse because everything's speeding up. And so what the body does, it causes the pyruvate to be stored as lactic acid. You've heard of lactic acid, I'm sure. Every athlete's heard of lactic acid, has felt lactic acid. It can be quite sore once it builds up. The beauty of this type of exercise is that in the recovery time, the liver converts that lactic acid back to pyruvate and feeds it into the powerhouse. Do you know what this means? Is that when you're in recovery time, let's define high intensity in recovery. Let me define high intensity. This is running as hard and as fast as you can go. Can't run? Bicycle, going as hard as you can go. Uh, can't bicycle swim. It's just going as hard and as fast as you can. It's not easy. In fact, it's very hard work, but it's only brief. 
What's recovery time? Well, if a person's really fit, it might just be a little tiny jog. Or if a person's cycling, it might be slowly cycling. Or if they're swimming, it might be just ah, a little breaststroke. And if they're doing push-ups, it could be just lying down on the ground, getting their breath. In recovery time, the liver converts that lactic acid back to pyruvate and feeds it into the powerhouse. Do you know what this means? that we are receiving just as much energy or producing just as much energy when we're doing nothing as when we're running for our life. That is the beauty of the interval training. And Doug McGuff in his book, Body by Science, he explains this beautifully. And he developed this for his heart patients because it had such a phenomenal effect. In fact, you can get more out of a 15 minute workout than you can get out of a 5K jog. Because when you do a 5K jog running non-stop, what's happening to your lactic acid? It's actually building up, creating a very acid environment in the cell. And an acid environment in the cell is where your anaerobic organisms love to thrive. As a person does the interval training, their heart gets stronger and stronger. You see, the heart is just a muscle. And the amount of exercise you do determines your heartbeat. And it is said we only have so many heartbeats in a lifetime. And when someone is exercising like this, they can bring their heart rate down, down, down. Let's say an athlete with a heart rate of 50 beats per minute. You consider this. Boom, boom, rest. Boom, boom, rest. They only have to beat like that because every beat is so strong, so powerful, it doesn't have to beat as much. But let's look at someone with a heart rate of 70, 75 beats per minute. It's boom, boom, boom rest, boom, boom, rest, boom, boom, rest. The heart beat is so brief and it's only pumping, only pumping a little bit. And how much rest is it getting? Very, very brief rest. The Framingham Heart Study, very famous study. You see, it wasn't paid by the pharmaceutical companies or the grain industries or the meat industries. It's a study that was done in the little town of Framingham. And it's been going for maybe, I think, 30 years now. People die and new people get put on. And I think the, on an average, it's looking at about 15, 20,000 people. And what they found was that by the age of, uh, I think it was by the age of 50, most people had lost 40% lung capacity. 40% lung capacity. Your lungs is where you take the oxygen or the air in. 40% lung capacity loss. Does that mean 40% of our cells are only running up there? Look at the energy that's being produced. Pitiful. They found by the age of 80, people had lost 60% lung capacity. Does that mean by the age of, by the age of 80, only 60% of the cells are running here, only 20% of the cells are running there? Muscle knows no age. Whether you're nine or whether you're 90, this applies. Age makes no difference here. And so many people today have no energy. They've not got no get up and go. And if you say to them, do you exercise? What's the answer? You don't understand. I haven't got the energy. Well, guess how you get it? This is how you get it. This is one of the best kept secrets is this tiny little nugget of exercise is so powerful, so efficient, you don't have to do it very much. So keeping the heart with all diligence, number one absolutely is exercise. Exercise is not negotiable if you want to keep your heart with all diligence. I think everyone has 15 minutes. That, that's all it takes. So we'll call the high intensity interval training. So you consider children. They either run for their life or they stop. You go to the African plains, no animal jogs. They either go for it or they stop. It's a very powerful way to exercise. And you can see by the illustration that I've given you in the cell why this is so. 
when you increase the oxygen going into your cell, you're increasing the energy 18 times. What a difference. So to keep the heart with all diligence, it must be exercised. Number two, food. What type of food does your cell need? Well, the three essential food groups are number one, fibre. And fibre is found in your plant-based food, but probably the highest fibre foods are your vegetables. Vegetables are high in fibre. Vegetables are high in minerals. Vegetables are low in sugars. And this is very important because minerals are your healers. Fruit, high in fibre, high in sugars, low in minerals. Fruit's not bad, but so many people today are challenged with diabetes, challenged with, um, with cancer. So for these people, best to keep fruit to a low. Also, the food, another food group that's an essential is protein. And the clearest burning protein is your vegetarian protein. So your vegetarian protein is found in your legumes, that's lentils, chickpeas, lima beans, black-eyed beans. When people complain that they may have wind when they eat it, I say, well, you're not preparing it properly, must be soaked. Then you rinse it, then you cook it, then you rinse it again, because that is dirty water. Then you flavor it, flavor it with some of the top quality oils, with uh, top quality salts, with some natural herbs. Another form of protein is nuts. Dr. Kellogg, very famous uh, doctor who wrote many books on health, he said nuts, nuts are one of the purest forms of protein. And seeds, pumpkin seeds, sesame seeds, sunflower seed, flax seed, chia seed. The other essential food group is fats. Because there are some fats that harm, often all fats are put in the same category. And yet fats are an essential food group. You see, 50% of the membrane around every cell in the body is protein, and 50% of the membrane around every cell in the body is fat. Fat is an essential nutrient. Our body cannot function without it. That's every cell in the body except for the brain cell. The brain cell is 70% fat. Your brain is the fattiest organ in the body. A lot of people stop the fats because they want to get their cholesterol levels down. So let's have a look at cholesterol. But before we do, let me just define the best fats is your nuts, your seeds, and your olive and coconut oils. These are two oils that have been used for centuries. So time testifies that they are the best quality oils. Make sure you get first cold pressed olive oil. Coconut's been used for centuries all through the South Pacific Islands. And these people experienced excellent help <clears throat> before white man came along with his refined foods. So cholesterol, let's have a look at cholesterol. Your liver makes cholesterol, and your liver makes cholesterol according to the body's demands. So if cholesterol levels are high, my question is, why? You see, cholesterol is like the Band-Aid in the body. Cholesterol has a few roles, but let's have a look. Your liver makes cholesterol, and 80% of the cholesterol that the liver makes is made from glucose and 20% of the cholesterol that your liver makes is made from fat. Now just having a look at that equation you can see that it's actually not the butter on the bread that's the problem, it's the bread under the butter. You see fat has got such a bad rap but it's more what it's been associated with 
So let's have a look at the two different types of cholesterol that the liver makes, the two main ones. You've got high density lipoprotein and high density lipoprotein is seen as the good guy because high density lipoprotein carries away excess. LDL called, well it's low density lipoprotein and it's called the repairer and the rebuilder because that's what it does. LDL has another role. LDL delivers cholesterol to the brain and the brain loves cholesterol. It's the fattiest organ in the body. Do you know the food that is the highest in cholesterol is breast milk? It's one of the fattiest foods and it's very high in cholesterol, particularly in the first month of life gets a little bit less in the second month, but it's still pretty high. That's because the developing brain must have cholesterol. The developing brain must have that high fat or it actually doesn't develop properly. Here's the ar arterial walls making up the artery. And because of its low density, LDL is always found on the edge. Because of its high density, HDL is found in the middle. Now let's say a person is smoking cigarettes. The 4,000 chemicals in the cigarettes damage the arterial wall and can even poke a hole in it. Let's say a person is breathing in mould every night from, you know, mould in the ceiling or mould in the pillows. Yeast in the blood can poke a hole in the walls. Let's say a person has a lot of mercury fillings in their mouth or they're trying to get healthy. How many people think fish is a good food? It is not. It's quite high in mercury. Mercury is neurotoxic. It's cytotoxic. So it can also eat holes in the arterial walls. And if a person's on a high sugar diet and a high alcohol diet that's feeding the microbes, what's going to patch up the hole. Because if that hole stays there, of course the blood leaks out. LDL being the repairer and the rebuilder patches up the hole. That's what it does. It saves us. Now what's supposed to happen is the person's supposed to stop smoking, stop drinking alcohol. They're supposed to get out of the mouldy house or burn their mouldy pillows and quilts, as the Bible says. They're supposed to stop eating fish and start having lentils and hummus for their protein. And what happens then is the damage stops. Do you know recently a friend of mine heard a talkback radio show where they're, sh where they're saying that the combination of milk and sugar can break down the arterial wall. Isn't that interesting? Milk and sugar, there's your ice cream, there's your custards. How many people put milk and sugar in their cups of coffees, teas, on their cereals? Many, many products have the combination of the milk and sugar. What's supposed to happen is all that's supposed to stop. And what else is supposed to happen is the person's supposed to be eating highly nourishing food and that gives the body everything it needs to actually rebuild up that hole. And when that hole is totally healed, then HDL comes along and can carry away that excess cholesterol. Can you see that HDL and LDL are the maintenance team in the arteries, holding that little capillary network, that, that little roadway that is carrying the river of life, the life of the flesh to every part of the body. And so if the cholesterol levels go too high, the question should be asked, why are they so high? What's damaging the arterial wall? Calling the cholesterol to plug it up. In our health retreat, I have several books. One's called The Great Cholesterol Deception by Dr. Peter Dingle. Another book is called The Great Cholesterol Hoax by Dr. Malcolm Kendrick. Now, Dr. Malcolm Kendrick is a British cardiologist. And this is what he said. For the first time, 
normal levels of a normal vital body substance is being called a disease. And of course, he's referring to cholesterol. I have another book, one's called The Cholesterol Con, one's called The Cholesterol Hoax. And this book is an e-book and it's by Dr. Dwight Lundell. He's a cardiovascular surgeon. He's performed 10,000 bypasses and his e-book is called The Cholesterol Lie. There are several books. One's called Who Will Tell the People It's Not Cholesterol? There's another book written by a physicist and it's called The, the Human Cost of Lipitor. Because if someone has high cholesterol levels, by the way, what are high cholesterol levels? Did you know that 40 years ago, doctors did not worry if the cholesterol level was under 300. Today, they get worried if it goes over 220. What's happened? The human body hasn't changed. I would like to suggest that it's the pharmaceutical companies. <laughs> that are saying that. Because if anyone had a cholesterol level 220 or above, they're put on cholesterol-lowering medication. Now, the two most common are Lipitor and Crestor. What do they do? They block the pathway in the liver that the liver uses to make cholesterol. But the same pathway that the liver uses to make cholesterol, it also uses to make coenzyme Q10. And coenzyme Q10 is your heart protective enzyme. So a person goes on cholesterol-lowering medication, they're told it will prevent a heart attack, it can actually increase it because they've now lost coenzyme Q10. Let me give you the side effects of Lipitor. Memory loss, dementia, Alzheimer's, muscle wasting. Can you see why people get memory loss? Alzheimer's and dementia when they go on cholesterol lowering medication because the brain needs cholesterol. The brain needs the fat. It's the fattiest organ in the body. They've just added another one to the list. It's breast cancer. And by my last lecture, you can see that if we don't have enough cholesterol, if our cholesterol levels aren't high enough, we can't make our sex hormones. We need cholesterol. God didn't make a mistake when he put LDL and HDL into our body. He didn't make a mistake when he got the liver to make it because you can see they're the maintenance team. We need cholesterol. If cholesterol levels go too low, that person can get depressed and even suicidal because the brain hasn't got its most important fuel. Many people stop the fats because... They're told that it's fat that raises cholesterol, but fat doesn't may raise cholesterol levels. Dr. Robert Atkins in the 80s, when he put his patients on his diet, which was high fiber, very generous proteins and fats, he did it for weight loss. And his patients' cholesterol levels were coming down. He scratched his head. Because what are we told? We're told that those are the foods that will get the cholesterol levels up but he found the opposite. He went into the medical journals and he found that even in the 70s, there was research that showed that dietary cholesterol has little or no effect on blood cholesterol levels. You see, it's the liver that makes cholesterol. And if it's making a lot of cholesterol, you've got to ask why. Is it the cigarettes? Is it the milk and sugar that people are having a lot of? Is it the alcohol? Is it the moldy pillow? Is it the mercury in the teeth? That's why the detective hat should ever be on because there is always a reason. One year ago, I spent a week with a woman who was a government certified PhD nutritionist. And that's, she's the one that told me, she said, it's just ridiculous. She said, 40 years ago, she says, as a nutritionist, we were told anything under, under 300 cholesterol levels was perfectly normal. She said, they've changed it. So a man came to me recently, said, my cholesterol levels are 250. I said, not a problem, <laughs> not a problem. <laughs> You'll never get Alzheimer's. The Framingham Heart Study showed that the people with high cholesterol levels never got Alzheimer's. 
See, the Framingham Heart Study, very reputable study. Every true scientist should be looking not just at the research that proves the, his theory, but at the research that disproves his theory. Every true scientist will look at that. That's true science. Another form of protein is your grains. So with the grains, we've got quinoa, buckwheat, and millet. Now the beauty of these grains is they are gluten-free. The hybridized wheat that was hybridized in the in the in the fifties, it was uh, went through some intensive crossbreeding by a Dr. Norman Borlaug, and the reason why he he was putting his wheat through intensive crossbreeding was they wanted to produce a plant with a high yield to help the starvation crisis. They did produce a plant with a high yield but they had to have it so that it only grew this high with a thick stem or the stalk would break. But what was never addressed was the effect of that hybridized wheat on the human body. And unfortunately, that hybridized wheat has an incredibly complex protein structure. And if the body cannot handle that protein structure, it gets the blood pressure up. So anyone who's wanting to conquer any heart problems should eliminate wheat. Now you can get the original wheat. It's called Enkhorn. I'll write it here. I was speaking to a lady in America only last week and she said that she's just ordered a whole bag of Enkhorn wheat. That's the wheat that God made. That's the wheat that hasn't been hybridized. Spelt is very similar. That's a wild hybrid. And uh, Kamut. Now the reason why I mention these now with heart health is because if a person takes the hybridized wheat, it can get the blood pressure up. Where anything that the, per that the person has an allergy to it, it affects the heart. So eliminate the wheat, and I'll put an HY here, that's the hybridized. Also what must be eliminated is caffeine. You see, when a person has a cup of coffee, their body reacts with a, uh, like a stress response. And that stress response always gets the blood pressure up. So there are two things that particularly can cause and contribute to high blood pressure. A lot of people with high blood pressure and heart problems stop salt, and that is a mistake. Let me show you salt. So sea salt contains, and that's basically from sea water, contains 92 minerals. Of those 92 minerals, 30% is made up of sodium and 50% approximately is made up of chloride. So you can see that of the 92 minerals, the largest amount is made up of sodium chloride. So what man does is he, is he waits till the water is evaporated and the first crystals formed are sodium chloride. Now he hasn't got time to wait for all the other grey slurry to be evaporated. So he scoops up the sodium chloride, uh, bleaches it white, puts aluminium with it so that it'll run freely and that's called table salt. And unfortunately it can be called sea salt. You can see why, well it's come from the sea. So table salt has two minerals. And the doctor is right. The table salt can cause high blood pressure. Let me show you why. Around every cell, there's a bilayered membrane. And in that bilayered membrane, there are 
sodium potassium pumps. See, the highest concentration of minerals inside the cell is potassium. The highest concentration outside the cell is sodium. So these sodium potassium pumps, they're constantly going like this, balancing the sodium and potassium in and out of the cell. There is a small amount of sodium inside the cell, but the largest concentration of mineral is potassium. Now, if someone is not eating any fresh fruit and vegetables, and that's where you'll find your potassium, especially your greens, and they're putting table salt on everything, and you know why? Because these two minerals are so harsh, they kill the taste buds. Have you noticed? People are pouring it on everything, and they haven't even tasted the food. That's because their taste buds are dying. These, these two minerals are so harsh, if they are in, injected straight into the blood, they would kill a person. They need all these other minerals to balance them out. So let's say we've got someone putting table salt on everything, not eating any fresh fruit and vegetables. What's happening now is sodium levels are rising and potassium levels are dropping. And with osmosis and diffusion, the highest concentration merges into the lowest concentration. Now sodium levels inside the cell are rising. That causes the cell to swell. There's your high blood pressure. And so then the person's told, stop the salt. So now they stop the salt and sodium levels inside the cell go too low and that causes a cell to swell too. In fact, if that cell doesn't have any sodium in it, it will explode. In Matthew 5, verse 13, Jesus says, Ye are the salt of the earth. If the salt hath lost its savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. That's old English. How does the salt lose its savour? I'd like to suggest that this salt has lost its savour. It's lost all of the minerals that it needs to balance it out. The body runs according to precision balance. We need to take sodium into our body the way it's found in nature because the fact is, let me draw for you the four vital elements needed for life. The four vitals. Number one is oxygen. And you can see by my illustration earlier how important it is to have oxygen in the cell. Number two is water. I'm sure that's not a surprise, but what's a surprise to most people is that sodium is the third most vital element needed for life. We need sodium. Every time we cry, every time we perspire, we're losing some. We need to replace it. But we need to replace it the way it's found in nature. Number four is potassium. Potassium is found in high amounts it's a mineral found in all your fresh fruits and vegetables, especially your dark green leafies. So if someone's told they shouldn't be eating salt, they have every right to say, excuse me, but it's, it's the third most vital element needed for life. You think about it, we cry seawater, we perspire seawater, we urinate seawater, baby swims internally in utero in seawater, we're salty people. In fact, one writer called it the internal ocean. To say that we shouldn't eat salt is very unscientific. It is actually quite dangerous. Sodium chloride is very important, but with all the balance of the other minerals. Our hydrochloric acid is made from chloride. If we're not having any salt, we actually can't digest our food properly because our hydrochloric acid is made from chloride. Lining the gastrointestinal tract of villi. On the villi there are receptor sites, the glucose comes down and this is where it comes into going through the blood and there's a carrier there and the carrier will the carrier says I will not accept you glucose unless you come with a molecule of sodium. If sodium is not present, glucose cannot get into the blood. It actually is released out of the body. This is a statement from the Anatomy and Physiology medical book. Sodium is the main transport system of glucose across the brush, border wall and into the blood. 
A soul-free diet is a ridiculous diet. It doesn't make any sense and it doesn't work. We need salt. And the salt we need is the balanced salt. The salt that we use at our health retreat is Celtic salt. Celtic salt contains 82 minerals. Some may say, where are the other 10? Well, they're in such pico proportion, barely measurable. It's inevitable that a few are lost in the evaporating process. Himalayan salt is very similar to Celtic salt. Himalayan salt also has 82 minerals, but the beauty of the Celtic salt and the reason I like it, it has three magnesiums. It has magnesium sulfate, it contains magnesium bromide, and it contains magnesium chloride. So these are the three magnesiums that are in Celtic salt and it explains why Celtic salt is such a moist salt because magnesium is a water-hungry molecule. This is a very important salt with the heart because the heart beats because of calcium and magnesium. Calcium constricts, magnesium relaxes. Calcium constricts, magnesium relaxes. So the Celtic salt with its three magnesiums is very important for proper heart beat. How much do we need? Well, in his book, The Calcium Lie, Dr. Robert Thompson, he says we should be having a crystal of this Celtic salt before every glass of water, and we should be having eight glasses of water a day. When a person is dehydrated, their heart doesn't beat properly. So number four, we need full hydration. And full hydration means that eight glasses of water are drunk over the day. in a 24-hour period. Unless you're working out in the hot sun and you're perspiring profusely, you will need some more. So we'll say eight glasses and with every glass. So not in the water. We should be drinking pure water. Put a little bit of salt on your tongue and drink the water down. So with, ideally, the Celtic salt. Dr. Lalangri, he is a French doctor who's written a book on salt. He says whenever he gets anyone with high blood pressure, he puts them on the Celtic salt because it balances it out. So eliminate the wheat, eliminate the caffeine, eliminate the refined salt. That's the one that is causing the problems. Another beauty of the salt and the, and the water is it keeps the blood thin. Remember when I said, the first, one of the first things I said was Proverbs 4.23, keep the heart with all diligence for out of the, it are the issues of life. The blood must be kept nice and thin. The only time really that the blood starts to thicken is with dehydration. And caffeine dehydrates very badly the, the whole body, especially the blood, so very important for full hydration. If, a pe if people are addicted to caffeine, and it's a highly addictive drug, I see many people suffer at Misty Mountain Health Retreat on the first day especially because we don't serve any caffeine. And the author of the book Caffeine Blues He's got a chapter in there called Coming Off the Bean. And he said, this is the painless way to stop coffee. Let's say a person has three cups of coffee a day. Well, the first day they, in their cup of coffee, it's half a teaspoon of coffee and half a teaspoon of something like Roma or Echo, um, a cereal beverage that's similar to coffee, but it doesn't have caffeine in it. And every day, when they make their cup of coffee, it's a little less caffeine or a little less coffee and a little more of the Roma or the, or the Echo. In Australia, we have one called Echo. 
If a person's having one cup of coffee a day, within one week they can be off their coffee without any suffering. If they have three cups of coffee a day, it may take them a little, a little bit longer, but they certainly will be able to get off the, the caffeine without the pain and suffering that so often happens. Number five of how we can conquer high blood pressure on how we can keep our heart with all diligence is early nights. There are five hours where the battery in our body is recharged. There are five hours where healing happens at twice the rate. And that is between the hours of 9 p.m. and 2 a.m. Many people today, because of technology, are going to bed too late and they're missing out on their hours of power. You know the old saying, early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy and wise. Science is now proving that that's, that's all because of the pineal gland, this little gland in the base of our brain that releases four hormones between the hours of 9 p.m. and 2, 2 a.m. It doesn't release them any other time. Daylight saving, it's between 10 p.m. and 3 a.m. One of the hormones is called melatonin. That's your fix and rejuvenate nighttime hormone. Another hormone is called apithalamin. It increases learning capacity, slows down aging. Another hormone is arginine vasotocin. Arginine vasotocin is a hormone that puts you into a deep sleep. It's also your natural painkiller. The other hormone that's released is serotonin. That's the mood hormone. If you want to feel good, go to bed early. There are some herbs. And remember Psalm 104 verse 14, where uh, the, the psalm tells us that God gave herbs for the service of man. There is a herb called the hawthorn berry. And the hawthorn berry strengthens the heart. If a person's blood pressure is too low, it'll bring it up. If it's too high, it'll bring it down. And remember that psalm, service of man. Herbs work with the needs of the body. If someone's on high blood pressure medication, I put them on probably a litre of the hawthorn berry tea a day. Um, we have tablets too that at our health retreat. And the tablets that we sell are about, uh, I think it's about 1,200 milligrams per tablet. So that person would only need two of those tablets a day. It's a very safe herb. You can double the dose if it's not give, giving you the effect that you want. And we've seen many people get off their blood pressure medication with the hawthorn berry. It's a very safe herb, so it can be taken in conjunction with the medication. And as the blood pressure comes down, then they can ease off their medication. The other herb that is a specific for heart health is cayenne pepper. Black pepper and chili pepper are both irritants to the lining of the gastrointestinal tract. Cayenne pepper is not a nervous system stimulant, but it's a blood stimulant. Some people don't use the cayenne pepper because it's a stimulant, but what you need to define is what sort of a stimulant. It's a blood stimulant. So what it does is it stimulates the blood and the blood is the life of the flesh, that anything that stimulates blood is healing to the body. You can get a ebook. you can download this one, it's called Curing with Cayenne and it's written by Sam Biser, B-I-S-E-R. Remarkable book showing all the areas that you can use cayenne pepper. There's another book called Back to Eden by Jethro Kloss. It was written I think in about the 40s and it's often called the Bible on herbs. He devotes half a page to every herb, 10 pages to cayenne pepper. Cayenne pepper will even heal a stomach ulcer. It's a remarkable herb. So if there's any bleeding and you put cayenne pepper on it, it'll cause the, the cut vessels to, to shrink together and seal up. But 
when you take cayenne pepper by mouth, it thins the blood and it opens all the blood vessels. I had an experience, oh, this is probably 15 years ago, and it was in our health retreat in Melbourne, and the call came through quickly, Barbara, a lady's just had a heart attack, it was in the middle of a cooking class. I was there in a few minutes, the lady was lying on the ground, there was a man taking her pulse, and he said it's very, very weak. It's very faint. She had no blood in her face. She was half conscious. She's about 80. Her husband said she'd had a few that year. I said to the staff, quick, cane pepper. I, I got cane pepper and, it, uh, you know, it was all in a crisis happening quickly. I think I got about half a teaspoon. I quickly put it in her mouth and I got the staff to give me a little bit of water. She was half conscious and she drank that down. And the guy holding her pulse, he yelled out in two minutes, he said, the pulse is strong. That was two minutes. See, it takes one minute for one drop of blood to go around your whole body. All the blood came into her face and she sat up and basically said, what happened? <laughs> it was quite remarkable. I had read about it and I saw it. And there must have been about 14 people in the cooking class and about five staff members. Everyone was amazed. I said, no, no, it's not me. It's the cane pepper. <laughs> we sold out of cane pepper, that program. Everyone was <laughs> amazed at, at what it had done. So what did it do for this lady? It thinned the blood. It opened those capillaries and caused a dramatic surge of blood through the whole body. It is a remarkable herb. So when, when the Bible says, keep the heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life, the cane pepper will strengthen the arterial walls, strengthens the heart. In fact, um, Sam Beiser in his book, Curing with Cain, he claims it can even rebuild heart muscle. But not only all of that, it thins the blood beautifully. A lot of people are on blood thinning medication and one of them is aspirin. The research now is showing, and I think this research has been out for a while that it causes the stomach to bleed, but brain bleeds is a recent one they're, they're showing that aspirin causes and eye bleeds. So aspirin can be contributing to Alzheimer's. It can be contributing to Alzheimer's because of the, the bleeding in the brain causes damage in the brain and the eye bleeding causing eye problems. Whereas cayenne pepper, it'll seal up any bleeding. It'll thin the blood beautifully. Another blood thinner that is sometimes prescribed is Wolfrin. Now Wolfrin is a rat poison. It causes the rats to bleed to death. So we've got a far better option and that is the cane pepper. In the book Back to Eden there are a few doctors that give their experiences with cane pepper. One doctor says it's impossible to abuse cane pepper and another doctor claims it can never cause a lesion. I've been working with cane pepper for over 20 years now and I actually find the same thing. It's an incredibly safe herb. It'll keep the heart with all diligence and it will also keep the issue coming out of the heart nice and thin. One of the things, as I mentioned, that thickens the blood really the most is the caffeines and also the refined sugar. Something else that thickens the blood is drugs. Remember, drugs never cure disease. They just change the form and location of the disease. And because the body sees them as a toxic chemical, it uses a lot of water to, uh, to try and protect the body from the harmful effects of the drugs. So to keep the heart with all diligence, make sure exercise happens every day. Make sure a plant-based diet is eaten. That automatically keeps a nice thin blood. Make sure you have adequate amounts of the fats. Fats are absolutely vital. But the fats that are vital are the nuts and the seeds, the avocados, the coconuts, and the olive oils. If you want to check out God's view on olive oil, get your concordance and do a Bible study on olive oil, and you will find it has the seal of God on it. It is a remarkable oil. 
eliminate. There are some things that should stop. Remember page 127 of the Ministry of Healing. In case of sickness, the cause should be ascertained. Wrong habits corrected. Unhealthful conditions changed. Then nature is to be assisted. How do you assist nature? The hawthorn berry, the cayenne pepper, the early nights, the plant-based diet, the exercise, eliminating the things that are hurting, keep full hydration. Then nature is to be assisted in her efforts to expel impurities and re-establish right conditions back in the system. We've got to keep the heart with all diligence because when that stops, we stop. And you know, one of the signs of our heart disease often is sudden death. Oops, too late. <laughs> And you can see why people are having so many heart attacks today. It's actually not the fat. And even though there is a build-up of cholesterol, to, to blame cholesterol for heart disease is like blaming the fire on the fire trucks. Well, the fire trucks must have caused the fires. They're always there. Can you see that cholesterol being blamed as heart disease is actually almost a smoke screen on the real reason? why these build-ups are happening in the artery. And remember, your brain needs cholesterol. It cannot function without cholesterol. We need the good fats, we need the good proteins, and we need the high fibres found in vegetables. Yes, some fruits, but fruits are not bad. It's just that if a person wants to lose weight, if a person has a yeast presence, if a person has diabetes, if a person has cancer, then the fruit needs to be kept to a very small amount and in some cases even eliminated for a period of time. The human body was designed to heal itself and it will heal itself if you give it the right conditions. <laughs>